I was glad. <laughs> when they said unto me, <laughs> let's go up to Karis Church <laughs> on Wednesday night because God's about to show up and show out and show off and reveal his power in this place. Amen? One of the words, we had a prophetic conference. How many had a chance to come to some of the prophetic conference? We had a time, and one of the words that the prophets spoke over this house, well, this is going to be a house where we're going to see signs and wonders and miracles take place on the regular. Whenever we gather together, and we're gathered together in this time, so we're believing that God's going to do an amazing thing tonight. Can somebody say tonight? tonight? And I'll tell you, I'm I'm one standing here because of the word of the Lord and because of the healing power of God. When I was born, I was born with a disease where my lungs were premature and I was on life support right out of the womb. And I was on life support for 11 days. And the doctors told my family to turn off the machines, the, the life support, because I wasn't going to live. And then the same time that the doctor called, my father, a prophet called and said, here's the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord is, is your son's not going to die, but he's going to live to preach and prophesy the word of the Lord. And within 18 hours, he'll be breathing on his own. And that's the moment where you have a word from the doctor, and we appreciate doctors. I worked in the medical field for a long time, and, but we also have a word from the Lord. And we regard the word of the Lord more than any other word, and that's the moment where you have to say, whose report are we going to believe? We're going to believe the report of the Lord. And so you can see what happened. The Lord healed me, and I'm standing here with the resurrection power of God that worked in my life, and I'm telling you, each and every one of us, we have testimonies. And I believe there's some healing. That same healing power that raised me up is the same healing power that's in this room right now. On Sunday morning, and by the way, for all of you first time, who, how many of your guests here first time, you first time to Karis Church? I see several people. God bless you. Thank you. Yeah, wave to me. Amen. At the end of the service, I'm, I, I like to sit right here. And if I've never met you before, I'd love to say hello and have you come introduce yourself. Love to hang out and talk and touch. My name is Pastor Patrick, and uh, my wife, Pastor Marlena, she's over in the Children's Center, I think, tonight, and so we're just uh, so honored to be in this house and to be pastoring this church, and we just love it here, because God is here, and y'all are here, so it's a good combination, amen? On Sunday morning, we were praying for people who came to make a commitment to Jesus and there was, how many were up there? About 14, 15 people that came up. And as they were standing here, I heard the Lord say that it's time for me to teach on hedges, creating a hedge. Somebody say a hedge. I'll explain what that is in a moment. Creating a hedge around your family, around your marriage, around your finances, around your mind. Creating a hedge. And so I got to work on Sunday night after having a two-hour meeting after the two-hour meeting. <laughs> I went home because I couldn't put it down. And then Sunday night and then Monday night during Monday night football, which I just, it was in the background, you know, because the 49ers already had won and the Cowboys already had lost. So it was a good weekend already. <laughs> And eyes have seen the glory. <laughs> the Cardinals, okay. Um, the Cardinals. With Kyler sitting on the bench, the Cardinals. Anyway, um, I'm teasing. But Monday night and then Tuesday night, I just kept get, getting these downloads, and so I started writing and writing. And the way I write oftentimes a study is, it just all just kind of comes out. And 24 pages later, I was like, okay, there's something we got to speak about hedges in here. 
And then today I was able to pare it down to 11 pages. And if I get through two or three, I'll be happy tonight. And so I'm probably going to have to turn this into a um, seminar or a video that I send to you later um, or something because I think this is very important. But I want to read a key verse on hedges. Somebody say hedges. In Job chapter 1, Job is the oldest book in the Bible. The o oldest, let me say it like this, recorded book in the Bible. The story of Genesis, of course, predates Job. But the oldest written book is Job. And so we have the oldest chapter, Job chapter 1, and the oldest story that's ever recorded in the Bible. And the oldest story ever recorded in the Bible was actually a conversation between God and and Satan. And so here's the conversation. Are you ready for it? Job chapter 1, verse 6 through 12. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. <coughs> and the Lord said to Satan, and by the way, when I spell Satan, I spell it lowercase s-a-t-a-n. He's not worth the capital. And the Lord said to Satan, Lucy, the father of lies, from where do you come? So Satan, there you go, thank you. Answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Satan had nothing else to do. I'll leave that alone right now. And then verse 8 says, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? Basically, before there was ever what about Bob? There was what about Job? Some people know about what I'm talking about. Other people, you've been in the way too long to know that. But have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on the earth? A blameless. Can somebody say blameless? An upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. Verse 9. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan always has these crazy questions. It goes right to the garden. And verse 10 says, have you not made a hedge around him? Somebody say a hedge. Yes. Put a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side. You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. Verse 11. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your face. And verse 12 says, and the Lord said to him, to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Satan was in the presence of the the Lord. Satan could be in a church service. <laughs> the name Job means persecuted one. The jo name Job means repentant. The name Job means come back. The name Job means the returning one. Somebody who has had a setback is now being set up for a comeback. Is there anyone knows what I'm talking about? Has anyone ever had some setbacks? Two people. Okay, good. I'm teaching here tonight, but I could slip over into preach. I'm just trying to behave here because we're moving into a healing anointing. But 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 there's something is happening happening here. And so Satan, three things is number one, aware of God's hedge around Job. He's aware of it. He also realizes that he's limited by God's hedge. And he hates God's hedge. I can't touch this. Before hammer. <laughs> Satan knows that he cannot touch him. And, 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 and it's amazing because in this first conversation, 
in the biblical history, we find this protective hedge is revealed that Satan knows he cannot touch you. When you walk blameless and upright, Satan cannot touch you. Now, there's two ways. I'm going to teach here for a minute. Can I teach here for a minute? And then I'm going to talk about two or three hedges, okay? Because there's a bunch of hedges, but I'm going to talk about the hedge of your mind, the hedge of your emotions, and the hedge in your body. And then we're going to pray for bodies, and bodies are going to be healed here tonight. In el nombre de Jesucristo. Amen. Okay? There are two ways that you can break a hedge. Number one, we can break it. Well, there's two, two ways a hedge can be broken. Number one, we can break it. How can we break it? By sin, by doubt, by unbelief, by fear, by disobedience, by unforgiveness, by having an attitude that is contrary to God's word. We can break the hedge. We can fear our way out of the hedge that's around us. We can doubt our way out of the hedge that's around us. We can step into a spirit of forget unforgiveness and the hedge can be broken. Is this okay? Can I teach for a minute? The only other way that a hedge can be, a divine hedge can be broken is if God gives Satan permission. Satan, see I'm not, I wasn't planning on getting into this, but Satan cannot do anything without permission. Is it okay to talk like that? Okay, I'm just seeing what, what, where, where you're at. But when you're under attack, when you're under a moment of attack, there's a few things you got to do. Number one, you got to look at your heart. Number two, you need to examine your attitudes. How many of you sometimes you, you attitude can be some attitude? You got to look at your thoughts, examine your thoughts, examine your motives. Another thing you got to do when, when you're under attack is you got to check your mouth. You better check yourself before you wreck yourself. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And we can sometimes talk our way into mess that we don't need to be in. You know what I'm talking about? We can talk ourselves into stuff. We can talk ourselves out of stuff. We can talk out of our stuff out of. God says, I'm going to give you the promised land. And you can talk yourself out like the ten spies out of entering into the promised land. We can talk ourselves. You got to check your mouth. I think our mouth is a dangerous thing. That's what James says. It's, it's, it, it has this power to bless and it has a power to curse. And you can forget about just even other people even blessing or cursing you. We can bless and curse ourselves. We have to be very careful what comes out of our mouth. We need to know when to be quiet. Some things don't need to be said. Okay, I'll stop. I'll leave that one alone. But you know what I'm talking about. Better check yourself before you wreck yourself. And they got to see if there's any sin because if there's any sin, then we got to just say, you know what, God, I'm going to confess it right now and I'm going to repent and I'm going to invite you afresh into my life. Sometimes, sometimes you might have to do that 10 times in a week. You just got to confess your sin, confess your faults one to another, confess your faults and get clean and be like Psalms 139 where it says, search me, O God, and know my heart and know my anxieties and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me to the everlasting the way everlasting. Search me. Examine me. Woo! Clean me. Cleanse me. Wash me. Make me new. Because guess what? We all, watch this, have the potential for greatness, but at the same time, we have the capacity for catastrophe. In me, Pastor Patrick Coitley, I have the potential for greatness. But I also have the capacity for catastrophe. And so I have to understand that, you know something? I need Jesus. I need God. I don't have it all together. I don't know when I said it. I think I might have said it on Sunday. If you're looking for a perfect church, you've come to the wrong place. We only have a perfect God. And we're trying to be like our daddy. And so we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so you're not walking into a room where everyone's got it all together. This is not a group bunch of Pharisees and Sadducees. And guess what? They're sad, you see. But there's a bunch of people up in here who are saved by the blood of the Lamb, who received His mercy and His grace at the throne of grace. 
and he's healed us and he has delivered us and he set us free. But we still have leaks in our vessel. And so we need Jesus. Every hour I need thee. Remember the old hymn? Every hour. Can somebody say every hour? Some people it's every 15 minutes. <laughs> Some people it's every minute. Every hour. Every hour I need thee. Oh, how I need thee. There's something where you get a revelation. And you get an understanding that I don't have it all together. But I have a God who does. And my daddy does. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. And he's watching over me. And he loves me in spite of me. Two people. Okay, good. But you understand something in this scripture. And I'm going to talk about these three hedges now. But you have to understand. I want to give somebody a revelation. You, and I make an announcement. You are not Satan's punching bag. I'm sorry. We're, put, we're drawing a line with some of this. And we have an authority. And he even admits it in the first oldest chapter in the Bible recorded. He admits it. I can't touch you. And so somebody, I want you to take your name. Can you say your name? One, two, three. Patrick. Okay. What's your name? One, two, three. Okay. Make this statement. Say, Patrick. Satan cannot touch me. Now, come on, say it to yourself one more time. Say your name. Sorry. Satan cannot touch me. So you got to get a revelation. He cannot touch you. He cannot have you. You are a child of God. Like the song goes, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. There's something powerful in that. But you understand, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I'm no longer a slave to lust. I'm no longer a slave to pornography. I'm no longer a slave to grieve. I am a child of God. You start getting a revelation. I am a child. Ooh, and you just look at the enemy and be like, can't touch this. Uh, no, no, no. In the common English version, it says of Job 1.10, listen to this. He says, you are like a wall, Satan says to God. You are like a wall protecting not only him, but his entire family and all his property. You have made him successful in whatever he does, and his flocks and his herds are everywhere. You better believe it. He is a wall. Like the old school song, Jesus be a fence. See, i got to skip all this. i got pages to skip. Okay. Somebody say, a hedge, a hedge. for my mind. mind. I'm going to lay this down real quickly, real quickly. I can't get into all the details because we're going to start praying in a moment. The first area of attack is where? In our mind. What does Joyce Meyer say? She calls it the battleground of the mind. How many know our mind, like the old school song, used to say, my mind's playing tricks on me. And our mind, when our mind, I want, I want you to hear this. I want you to hear these words very clearly. When our mind is under attack, that's when the enemy taunts and torments us. And he has a goal of not just to taunting and tormenting, but robbing and mocking. The enemy comes, John 10, to steal, kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you may have life and life more abundantly. The enemy wants to rob. He wants to steal. He wants to steal your mind. He wants to steal your time. Amen. He wants to steal your relationships. He wants to steal your blessing. He wants to steal your birthright. He wants to steal your salvation. He wants to steal your soul. He wants to take you to hell with him. But he can't have you. Amen. He cannot have you. And so we need a divine strategy for our mind. Because our mind goes, 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 goes. Our conscious mind, our subconscious mind, our unconscious mind does not stop. It's always processing. Even when our conscious mind is going to sleep, the subconscious is processing. 
Some of your dreams are not from God. You're just processing your thoughts. Some of them are from pepperoni, pizza. Some of them are from the TV shows that you've been watching. Some of them from your scroll. Stop scrolling. We need a strategy. Somebody say strategy. strategy. Our mind. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Can somebody pull down a stronghold? A stronghold. What's a stronghold? A house made of thoughts. And so here's how a house made of thoughts, how it's made, a stronghold's made. You ready? It starts with random thoughts. The random thoughts, can I just break this down for you? And I can't get into this too deep, but I'm just going to just basics, okay? The random thoughts are the materials that are dropped off on your driveway to build the house. So the lumber is dropped, the sheetrock drops, the nails drop, you go on and on. All the materials are the thoughts. When we take those thoughts, the next part, when we take those thoughts, we start putting the materials together through concepts and ideas and imaginations. Have you ever had a thought turn into an imagination? Where you're imaging something that might not even exist, but nonetheless your thoughts took you there. And all of a sudden you're putting the house together. And if you continue to allow those thoughts to turn into imaginations and concepts and pictures and ideas, then all of a sudden a stronghold has been built. A house has been built. And a house has been built so that something may occupy it. Are you catching what I'm saying? So if you have a stronghold, a house made of thoughts, something is going to occupy it. And if the materials that have made this house come from Fear Depot, And doubt hardware. Can I talk to somebody up in here? Then guess who is going to live in that house? The spirit of fear. And the spirit of fear. See, I'm dealing with something because there's some things that have to actually be, if we're even going to see some miracles, there's some things that have to be cast out. <laughs> and I'm tired of the enemy trying to occupy and bring strongholds to God's people. And the spirit of fear never comes by himself. The enemy always has friends. When you look at when Jehoshaphat was being attacked, you find that it wasn't just Ammon, but it was Mount Seir. And I forgot the other one right now. There was three of them that came together in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, they didn't just come by themselves. There was a confederacy. And that's how the demonic works. The demonic realm works is they come together. There might be one lead in, but fear doesn't just come by itself. Fear may come with doubt. Fear may come with unforgiveness. But it's never alone. And so you have this house that's been built, and it's in your mind and we need a divine strategy to pull these things down, to bulldoze these houses, if I can say it in these terms, to bulldoze the stronghold of poverty, the stronghold of inferiority, the stronghold of unforgiveness, the stronghold of infirmity. I can go on and on, make a list here. A stronghold of a religious spirit. There's some people, it's amazing how 
some of the most unbelieving people on the planet actually have a religious spirit working in their life. There's different strongholds, and we have to bulldoze them down, and we need to have the Spirit of God come, and we need a hedge of protection put around our minds. And so what God does is, he says, guess what's going to happen? For every spirit that's tried to come up against you, I'm going to actually give you three for one. So, Timothy, God has not given you the spirit of fear, but he's given you a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. I'm going to give you power. I'm going to cause you to, to have power to overcome, dunamis power to overcome fear in your life. I'm going to give you a strength that is beyond yourself. And I'm going to empower you, and you're going to be strong, and you're going to look at the spirit of fear, and you're going to say, spirit of fear, you got to go. You're fired. Here's your pink slip. You cannot stay here. There's something inside of me. It's dunamis power. And you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. When you get the Holy Ghost, you get power. But I'm not just giving you power. I'm giving you love. And perfect love casts out all fear. And I'm not just giving you power and I'm giving you love, but I'm giving you a sound mind. What does a sound mind mean? It means a fence, a head. I'm going to put, woo, in this exchange here that's taking place, fear, go, power, come, love, come, and guess what? A sound mind, a hedge around your battleground, your mind. And then you read scriptures like, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, where he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, somebody say bodies, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, metamorphosis, by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The good and acceptable, perfect will of God. Philippians 4 verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, thank on these things. How am I going to put a hedge around my mind? I got to get the word inside of me. I need to have my mind renewed. I'm no longer conformed, but I'm transformed. There's a whole lot of people who are conforming. If you watch CNN all night, And his evil twin fox, all night, every day, playing, waking up in the morning, going to bed at night. Guess what you're going to be doing? You're conforming to a system. There is a world system at work. And it's trying to get us programmed and conformed to its way of thinking so that we can live its way of life that it wants us to live. But somebody is not going to be conformed, but you're going to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind is going to be made new because there's a hedge around it and your mind is being transformed and, and, and the way you think and the way you thought and the way you process doesn't 
happen that way anymore because the word of God, the word of Jesus is dwelling in you richly. And so you think differently, you talk differently, you walk differently, you act differently, you move differently, you decide differently, you choose differently. Everything is different because you look through the lens of the word of God. Because Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow. Do you realize that the word of God's going into the joints and your marrow right now? It's surgical. It's going into your body right now and it's quick. And it's alive and it's powerful and it's sharper than a, a, than a surgeon's scalpel. And it's going in and it's working in you right now. The word of God's going into your body right now. It's going right down to the cellular level of your body right now. Trust me, I worked in the medical field. I know about cells because I worked with stem cells and I did 400 seminars for doctors and nurses and patients and sports teams and I understand all that stuff and sometimes I would be in those seminars I'm like looking at people and they'd have neuropathy and they'd have they'd have radiculopathy and they have sciatica and they they have spinal issues and hip issues and, and I'm sitting there looking I'm like we have an answer for you in the medical field but then I would sit back and I'm like wait a second You could spend $30,000 on getting these injections or in less than 30 seconds, we can lay hands on you. And you could be healed. We've been seeing a lot of that. So I want you to pray this word with me for the mind. Ready? I got to move quickly because I have emotions and body. I'm going to move them quickly. But, but just make this declaration say, the word of God says, God says that let this mind be in you that was also in Christ. The word of God says that I have the mind of Christ. And so I come against any random, ungodly, unclean thoughts that are trying to run around in my mind. I pull them down. I cast them out in the name of Jesus. Every stronghold come down, down, down. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. See, sometimes you got to get an attitude with the enemy of your soul and say, enough is enough. I'm not playing with you no longer. You see, the enemy's not playing. He wants to kill you. I got an announcement. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy your children. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to destroy your body. And so there's something inside of me. Pastor Patrick, I'll be nice on Sunday and tell you a funny story. I don't have any funny stories here tonight. I only have one story. The enemy's coming down. Strongholds are coming down. Sickness is coming down down in the name of Jesus let the church say some of these people are like where did they get this white boy from I am from the hood born in East Oakland somebody say hedge for my mind I'm going to go quickly on these next two because we're going to pray for healing there's a healing anointing moving in this room very quickly I feel it so move quickly. I'm just going to skim here because I have so many hedges you wouldn't believe it. So I'm going to have to make a video or something. Somebody would want this teaching? Yeah. This, is like, this is like a four-hour seminar. And so I'm just trying to skim here. So I skim through that. Hedge for my emotions. Somebody said, hedge for my emotions. So the saying goes, don't let your emotions get the? How many have ever had your emotions get the? Best of you. On the regular. On the real, our emotions. You just watched the Dallas Cowboys lose to the Cardinals. 
and your emotions get the best of you. And Pastor Patrick gets up and says, well, the 49ers won. The emotions get the best of you. But emotions affect everything. They affect your health. You can emote yourself into sickness. <laughs> your emotions can affect your mind. Your emotions can affect your decisions. Your emotions can affect your actions. And so we need to line up our emotions. We need to make an announcement to our emotions. Emotions are a part of our soul. What is our soul made up of? Our mind, will, and emotions. Our thoughts, our decisions, and our feelings. It's our soul. And so at a certain point when you talk about spiritual alignment, your spirit aligns with the Holy Spirit. And so then your soul, which includes your emotions, must align up with your spirit that is aligned up with the Holy Spirit. And then you make an announcement to your body. Body, you're going to have to line up with my mind, will, and emotions, who is lined up with my spirit, where my spirit is lined up with the Holy Spirit. And so you have to understand that there is like this spiritual protocol. There's this spiritual alignment God's spirit my spirit my soul my body and each level down you have to make an announcement to your tripart self and let your tripart self know listen you got to come under the headship of the Holy Spirit of God so one may wrestle let me move quickly here with anxiety Maybe a fear of sickness. Maybe a fear, maybe a fear of flying. Maybe a fear of accidents. Maybe a fear of financial, your finances caving in. There's two kinds. I want you to catch this here. There are two kinds of emotions that, can I say this nicely, but I'm going to say it straight, that call in the demonic into your life. One is fear. The other is hatred. And hatred can manifest itself in two ways. One as unforgiveness, the other as bitterness. And unforgiveness masks itself sometimes under the guise of hurt and church hurt and people hurt. But really, the hurt is an excuse for unforgiveness. And unforgiveness has a twin called bitterness. And the two of them, when you put them together, are really, when you really get down to the lingo, is hatred. And there's nothing that calls the demonic into your life more than fear and hatred. Why? Why? Because fear and hatred are the two spirits that compose the atmosphere of the demonic. And so why in the world are two of the greatest spirits that are operating in the earth are fear and hatred? CNN and Fox News. Fear and hatred. Ooh, gosh, he's getting into it. Yes, he is, because I've had enough of it. Because that's the prevalent spirit. There's other things. There's perversion. I mean, we go on and on. There's other things. But the two things that call in the easiest, the demonic realm into your life is fear and hatred. But we said God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and a love and a sound mind. David had a prayer, and I'm going to move on. But David had a prayer, and we're going to pray a prayer of our emotions in Psalm 69, verse 13 through 16, he said, But I pray to you, Lord, in the time of your favor, in your great love, O oh God, answer me with your sure salvation. And here he goes. Rescue me from the mire. He's talking about something that's deep inside of his soul. He's not in the, he's not in the mud. It's in his soul. It's in his emotions. 
Rescue me from the mire. Do not let me sink. Has anyone ever sunk in your emotions? Emotions are like quicksand. It sucks you up, sucks you up, sucks you up, and wants to kill you. He says, deliver me from those who hate me from the deep waters, emotions. Do not let the flood waters engulf me or the depths swallow me up or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, Lord, out of the goodness of your love in your great mercy, turn to me. It's powerful because he's just basically saying, I need my emotions, you in my emotions. And one of the hedges that we need is in our emotions. And sometimes the guys look and say, well, the ladies are all emotional. No, no, dude. You're just as emotional, if not more. You got feelings, you just stuff them. The ladies, they... We're just like, <laughs> but the ladies, they, they got a secret. They know how to release their soul and release their emotions and dudes be like trying to be tough and all stuff like that. But you're just as human as she is and you have just as many feelings as she does. And sometimes it's okay to come to the presence of the Lord and come into the atmosphere and release your soul. And here is David modeling this for us. And he's like releasing his soul. Save me from the depths. Pull me out of the mire. I got feelings inside of me and I can't keep stuffing them. Because if I stuff them, I'm going to move into a place of self-soothing. Can I speak to the men? We self-soothe. How do we self-smooth? Pornography. How do we self-smooth? Come on, somebody. I, there's children in here. I'll be nice. Stuff. But there's a certain point where you got to put a hedge around your emotions. Male, female, whoever. We got to ask God. We got to pray and say, God, put something around my emotions. Because I'm moved, everything's moved in my life by emotions. So somebody say, Lord, Lord tonight, I pray tonight I pray that you help me, you help me build, a build a hedge around my emotions. I'm not going to faint, but I'm going to wait on you. I'm not going to be tentative. I'm not going to be anxious. I'm not going to be discouraged. I'm not going to walk in depression. I'm not going to walk in confusion. I'm not going to be fearful, but I'm going to be strong and of good courage. Last one. Last one I'm going to pray. Hedge for my mind. Hedge for my emotions. Hedge for my body. Oh, I got a bunch of other ones. I got hedge for my spirit. Hedge for my morality. Hedge for my finances. Hedge for my leaders. I got seven protectors, but I'm just going to go for my body. In Psalm 103, verse 2 and 4, David said, bless the Lord, O my soul. And forget not all his benefits. How many know that when you come into Jesus, there's a benefit package? And it's better than any 401Ks and any Baylor Scott and Whites and VA affairs. It never runs out. Who forgives your iniquities. Watch this. Here's the line right here tonight. Who heals... See, there's healing in this room happening right now. Before any hand is laid on, before any oil is put on you, there's healing in this room. He heals all. Isn't that beautiful? So I don't care what they come up with or what lab they even invent something in. Ooh. Who redeems your life from destruction. Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Now, three hedges in your body I want to talk about here for a second. I'm going to close. There's an accidents and disasters hedge. 
I want to put a hedge against accidents and disasters. This church knows this intimately. This church went through an accident and disaster. And so one of the things I believe God wants to do in this house, in our lives, is before you go out the door, you just say, Lord, we put a hedge around us against accidents and disasters. I mean, wake up in the morning and make that declaration every day. In the name of Jesus, we put a hedge against accidents and disasters. Before I travel, before I go on a trip, before I do anything, there's a physical hedge being put around my life against accidents and disasters in the name of Jesus. Can somebody say, I am, I am safe, safe from accidents and disasters in the name of Jesus. Number two, I'm talking about your bodies here. A hedge against attacks and assassinations. You watch. In this hour of evil, and I'm not trying to speak doom and gloom, but there are going to be interesting moments in the earth, in governmental arenas and different ones, where attacks and assassinations are going to increase. And it's just a sign of the times. And so Psalm 142 in verse 3 through 5, David said, When I'm overwhelmed, you, will, you alone know the way I should turn. Wherever I go, my enemies have set traps for me. I look for someone to come and help me, but no one gives me a passing thought. No one will help me. No one cares a bit what happens to me. Then I pray to you, O Lord, and I say, You are my place of refuge. You are all I really want in life. Whoo! Psalm 25, verse 15. I always look to you because you rescue me from every trap. Psalms 91 is the soldier's song. Psalms 91 could be and maybe should be read every single day over your life. Come on, somebody. Who he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. You read Psalm 91. There's a story of a missionary. You know him, Pastor Nick's name is Dennis Balcom. My grandma sent him to China to be a missionary. He's a modern-day Hudson Taylor. He's considered an apostle. He came out of our church in Oakland. And he's, he's considered the apostle over 150 million Christians in underground China. Before he was ever sent to China, because he says sent there in 1969, he served in Vietnam. Any veterans in this room? We want to honor you here. In fact, we're, we're, we're putting something together because of the prophetic word of the Lord for Veterans Day this year. It's going to be fun. But... Pastor Dennis Balcom was serving in Vietnam, and his friend and him were with their platoon, and they were, there was a firefight. There was a lot of shooting going on, a lot, of, a lot of bullets flying, and his friend got hit in the chest and fell to the ground. And when he fell to the ground, this is a wild story, he was looking to see where he was hit because he knew he was hit, and he was trying to find where the blood was, and... What had happened was, was before he went out into the battle, he stuck a Bible in his chest pocket. And this is a true story. And the bullet went into the Bible and stopped at Psalm 91. It went and stopped at Psalm 91. I'll tell you, there's something that God wants to put over your life of protection against attacks and assassinations. Stuff has happened when it was Fort Hood. There were things that happened. Stuff happened in El Paso. They happened in different parts of this country. We've seen attacks and assassinations. But there's something about waking up in the morning and saying, God, I'm going to be safe from attacks and assassinations. Is it okay to put hedges like this? There's hedges being put around you. And the last one, and this is leading me in here now, and I went longer than I was supposed to, so I apologize. 
But I think this is good stuff. So accidents and disasters hedge. Attacks and assassinations hedge. And the last one, infirmity and disease hedge. Woo! So when you're sick, what do they say? Take it to Jesus. Submit it to God. And then when you're sick, begin to speak the truth of God's word. God sent his word and he healed me of all of my diseases. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is here right now to quicken, resurrect my mortal body. In Jesus' name, that same spirit is in me. Healing is the children's bread. It's my bread. That's what I partake of. And guess what? The only other thing I'm going to do as I declare God's word is I'm going to resist the devil and he's going to flee from me. And tonight, I want to get an attitude because I've had an attitude all night long with infirmity and disease because God wants to put some fight in somebody tonight. And you got you to gotta stand up. Stand up with me as we, as, as we move into this moment here. Stand up with me. Get your, get your bony prophetic finger out. And I want you to, to make an announcement to your body and say, hey, body. God's going to about to do something inside of you right now. And I speak to every sickness and every infirmity and every ailment and every pain and every disease. I speak to cancer. I speak to diabetes. I speak to hypertension. I speak to joint pains, spine pains, migraine headaches, insomnia. Get out! Every sickness of every form, get out in the name of Jesus. I claim tonight a health hedge around my body, around my family, in the name of Jesus. Sickness, you gotta go. You will not dwell in my home, in my body, in my family, and in my church. Get out of my house. God is protecting me now. And he's putting a hedge around my body. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And somebody said, amen. Be seated, be seated, be seated. Where's her mic? Where's her mic? Okay. Woo! Woo, yada, so, shoto. Kiara, baba, so. God's going to move very quickly here tonight. If you need a touch in your body, I want you to stand right now. God's going to move very quickly in this room. We've had many, many, many miracles. We've only been here for about 100 days since we became pastors here, just about 100 days. And in the time frame that we've been here, we've seen many, many different types of miracles. We've seen cancer leave. We've seen sickness of all types leave. We've seen people's shoulders or rotator cuffs being healed. Their ankles being healed. Fractures coming back together. I mean, we've seen, we've seen so many things. I mean, creative miracles. And God's about to do some creative miracles in this room right now. And so fear of death is leaving you now in Jesus' name. Fear of death is leaving you now. Let me tell you something about death. Can I tell you something about death? My, my wife, Pastor Marlena, she's over with the kids. Her grandmother died two Tuesdays ago, the week of the prophetic conference. On Tuesday, she passed. And her mother went into the hospital room and called her back. She's 102 years of age. She goes to the nail shop. She goes to the grocery store. And she called her back. And she comes back for four days. And all the family starts flying to San Diego to go say goodbye because 
She's not even sick. She's just going. And she begins, I wish I could just play it for you. Maybe next time we do the healing service, I'm going to play this, this, this recording. Have you heard it? <laughs> Have you heard it yet? You've heard it. I'm going you I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, you have to hear this. I wish I had it with me right now. About six minutes long. She begins to tell us what happened when she died. <laughs> she said, I went there and it was perfect. She said, death is not what you think it is. She said, I, I, th I used to have this trepidation, this fear, like, what, what is this? And she said, it's perfect. She said, I was like, she's 102. She was like, I was like about 20 years of age. And I just, I just felt good. And, and she's sitting there telling the story. And she's like, I was just kind of moving through like these curtains. They were like folds. And I was moving through these curtains. And I was slipping away from the earthly. And I was moving to the heavenly. And then you all called me back. And she said, if this happens again, don't, don't, don't call me back. And she said these words, among many things. She said, if this is dying, it's fun. She said, I wasn't sick. I wasn't tired. I wasn't weary. And I just looked at my old body and my bones, and it looked like just a, a bunch of gym clothes just lying there. And I had to come back into that. Because if this is, she kept saying, if this is dying, this is fun. I get to be with Jesus. I could sense the presence of Jesus. And so one of the things God wants to do is take away the spirit of fear and the fear of death. <laughs> I'll start with that. Now we move into healing. Because what God wants to do, and the word over this night when I came out was walking across the parking lot. I was just walking across the parking lot with my bag, came from, come from the dinner, and I heard the Lord say these words, life extension is being released in this room tonight. Whatever the doctors have said, that's fine. There's some people in this room, maybe the doctors have given you a year to live or six months to live. <laughs> or maybe the enemy's trying to speak a sentence over you. That's so breaking it tonight in Jesus' name. There's power in the name of Jesus. You sang it here tonight, Haley. I want you to sing this over this everyone again because we're going to pray in the name of Jesus and bodies are going to be healed in this room. There's a man coming. I'm preaching this Sunday. And then there's a man coming the next Sunday from Johannesburg, South Africa. He's a gentleman I went to Bible college with. He gave a prophecy over this house. I need to play that for you too. Maybe I'll play it this Sunday. Okay, Pastor Jackie said I need to play that. Because one of the things he said was that people's lives are going to be extended in this house. And that there's going to be a whole bunch of people. How did he say it? He said, like, something yeah I do. it's that people who are older are going to live longer and going to be stronger and this house is actually going to be known there's a company of people they're going to be like warriors that God's going to raise up in this time and so there's life extension being released in this room here right now in Jesus name And so if you are standing here, I'm going to pray a general prayer and then we're going to start calling people up. But if you need to touch your body, you're standing here, just lift up your hands to heaven. Jesus is in this room. And I want, Pastor Haley, I want you to sing over the power in the name of Jesus. And we're going to pray in his name. And it's like Peter and John in Acts chapter 3, where they looked at the lame man and they said, silver and gold have I none. I don't have stuff to give you that's natural. But such as I have, I give to you. What I have for you is supernatural. 
in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. There's power in the name of Jesus. Can somebody say that with me? There's power. In the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody, let's declare this. There's power. There is power. 